Before I came to Australia, I did an undergraduate degree in sculpture, four years in the UK. Very hands-on, very sort of artistic, You're working for yourself, working with your own ideas. After that, I went to work in the UK film and TV industry. It was, the, it was the birth of a lot of eras in that time. It was the birth in a lot of TV advertising, different ways of doing advertising. It was certainly the birth of um, music industry, uh, music videos, MTV starting up. 82, 82, 3, 84. And that was predominantly the work that we did. And I mention that because the work in any TV and film industry, of those who've worked in it, is very collaborative. You don't work on your own, you work with a whole team of other people. Um, so artistic background, as in sculpture, four years I did sculpture, sculpture and life drawing, that's all I did for four years. So it was interesting coming from that very artistic background, very free background, and then into the TV and film industry, which was very... Um, very collaborative, very supportive, very fast, of course. Um, then moving to Australia, came and worked for this institution. I went from full-on collaboration to back to individualness, you know, very prescribed sort of things. And as this guy here formed sort of one end of my research over the last 15 or 20 years, this is a guy called Paul Rand, um, American graphic designer, who, uh, if you don't know Paul Rand, he's designed logos, really well-known ones like um, IBM, um, UPS delivery services, Westinghouse, all these old American ones, ABC in America, and even Enron. And in 87, he uh, wrote about that design is a personal activity that springs from the creative impulse of an individual. That's interesting. So it's all about personal stuff. And when I was doing my sculpture degree, back in, whenever it was, 83, I'd have totally agreed with him. And he went on to say that group design, or group creativity, let's call it, can actually hinder the creative process and deprives you as the, as the maker of what he calls accomplishment and self-realisation. So, you know, it's great when you're working alone. It's, it's really self, it's kind of selfish in a way. But as soon as you work with other people, you've got to share that, and that's going to take away from your personal drive. Ten years later, in sort of around the, you know, 90s and you know, late 90s, this guy here, a guy called John Warwicker, who became a real mentor of mine, who co-founded a group in London called Tomato, and some of you might have heard of them, and they were really uh, massively sort of famous as well, doing all the big ads like Nike and Adidas and, and all these sort of wonderful sort of really, really arty sort of new graphic kind of flavour to it. Um, and has moved on to incredibly multidisciplinary projects. They were involved in um, a lot of the work in Federation Square down in Melbourne and they do stuff all over the world. He sort of observed that um, the world had changed. He talks here about um, we're in a new period of connectivity, relativity and pluralism. And obviously the internet helped that. Um, and the value of the individual was seen in a collaborative context, much in the same way that when I worked in the film industry, it was very much like that. You really didn't get singled out, you were part of a team, which I liked, I, I like working like that. So those two viewpoints formed the bookends of my interest. One was saying that everything should be individual and, and that's how it is, and then more progressively, everything is now collaborative. Well, what about, you know, how does that sit? Is that the case? You can't be all collaborative or all individual. But what really made me interested was in 2002, I was chairing a session at one of the Fresh conferences in Singapore. And this guy here, a guy called Neville Brody, who, it was the time when everyone was getting really excited about technology and you could use Director and Flash and you could go on screen and if you put a nice bit of code in, you could make things move. And everyone was going, ooh, wow, isn't that cool? Um, and what he was saying was, um, this is actually quite a difficult time for design. Um, there's loads and loads of people who know how to do really fancy tricks and are great with computers, etc., 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 but not everyone's getting caught up with the what or how of what they're doing. And he asked, why aren't more people asking, why are we doing it? And that really um, came home to me as he was talking to thousands of people. And I think it went over lots of people's heads. They were still, oh, phew, don't want to listen to that. I just want to play with this technology. Now, I don't know if it was I was a bit older, and he was as well, I'm probably about the same age as him, um, is that you know, I've looked at computers for many, many years and you kind of get bored of them after a while. They stop being this sort of, woo, they can't do wonderful things. You start thinking, well, I wonder what wonderful things I could do with it. Here at the college, I run a group called Omnium Group and we sort of split ourselves into four areas. One is about research, which the research is about simply what happens when you work online with other people 
in creative endeavours. That's it. Out of that, we had to develop a piece of software to be able to do all these wonderful things, which is basically like, I mean, if you look at what Facebook is now, it's kind of what Facebook is now 10 years ago. I'm not saying we're 10 years better than Facebook, but it's kind of social networks is what we were doing 10 years ago. It's just that we were using them to do creative things. And I'll explain that a bit later. So we have a piece of software, which used to be quite expensive and is now totally free, and you can download it in probably 30 seconds and set up groups of your own, which is really nice. The third thing which um, Ian's already mentioned is that I still run, as part of that, a, a design studio because the research can't, you know, isn't funded unless we get grants. So we have to raise money through our design studio. I work with very talented programmers and designers, two, two full-time graphic designers, but we also use the college's resources of students to pull in on various jobs and we work on real-life projects probably three or four at a time. I mean, I've quoted on three jobs this week to do websites and, and quite extensive websites or print materials or whatever people want. And that we generate money from that to pay for our other activities. And the most sort of interesting activity for me in my life now is the fourth one, which is the outreach projects. And that's kind of what I'm going to show you tonight is just about that area. I'm not going to talk about the other ones. There's too much to talk about all of them. So I want to talk to you about the outreach projects, why they started, and I, I suppose they really started for two or three reasons. One, they were a response to what Neville Brody was asking. You know, are, are people, why are not more people saying, you know, why are we designing, and therefore who are we designing for? It seemed to be, you know, design had this tag of, you know, it's designer, so therefore it's expensive and only applicable to the upper echelons. Yeah, absolutely, I, I totally disagree with that. That, you know, I thought design was about designing things to make life for loads of people easier. And in my case, I looked beyond that and looked at people who were really, really disadvantaged and see if we can make their life easier. So from a period of 99, when I started the very first Omnium Global design project or creative project, it wasn't just design, it was a, it was a whole load of artists from around the world and designers. And we ran our second one, which was a graphics sort of theory project, which involved practical work, but this time it had sort of structure to it. it, had a few lectures in there that were specifically written by people, very interesting. Then we went on to the next one where I got asked by somebody else to run a project for them and this was in science and in the uh, area of genomics. And 2007, which I'm going to show you in a second, was um, the sort of more recent project, um, probably the last big one that I ran, which was the first time that we went into a social kind of realm where we looked at helping people out. Ike Grada again came back to me and said, you know, would you run another project for us? But this time um, we wanted to work in the area of health, uh, public awareness of health issues. So I went to the, or I, I worked with the University of Auckland and people from their pharmacy school. And over this side, that little badge there is the International Federation of Pharmacists. And I came up with a project called Visualising Issues of Pharmacy, VIP. And we can see there the little tagline says, pharmacy and graphic design, design students working together to raise public awareness of critical health issues in Kenya, Africa. So I always like to put people online, and I talked before about how when you're doing stuff online, there's pros and cons. Well, one of the pros is that I can go and get Stefan Segmeister to come and work with us for two hours, even though he's in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong or Boston or wherever he is. He can come on online and work with us and in the morning, people can wake up and Stefan Sagmeister's been in and left them loads of feedback to their work. Wow, how are you going to get that? You know, it, you, you can't physically go and bring people over all the time. So there's one of the things where we use the online um, context in our favour. So in the case of this project for Africa, first of all, we, we located Kenya. That's where we were going to do this project. And not only Kenya, we located a specific little village in Kenya that was in the back of nowhere and had serious, serious problems in terms of health problems. People were dying, and not just the odd person was dying, but you know, villages were being wiped out by HIV, um, and also illnesses that were very preventable, like malaria and tuberculosis. But they were being wiped out because literally people didn't know what to do. So half the problem when doing a project like this is that someone like me, or the people that I'm working with, I am not Kenyan. I've never been to Kenya. I don't understand Kenyan people, I don't understand their language, I've never seen where they live. So it's very, very difficult for me to design stuff for them when I don't understand them. So half my problem is to make sure that I understand them. Or well, not just me, but the people that are going to work on it, the 200 people that we put online, have to be designing 
for the Kenyan audience, not for themselves. And that's half the battle, if not three quarters of the battle, is to first of all immerse yourself in the culture and make sure you get it right. So to do that, you always, whether you're doing something online or more recently when we do things face to face, you have to have representatives in those countries that not only can work a project like this, um, but they, they, you can trust them as well, that's a big issue. Um, you've got to be able to trust them and they've got to have the respect of the, of the community as well. So you can see here we started off in Africa by grouping together a whole load of these people have different colours. The, the two purple ones were health workers. These are Kenyan health workers living in these remote areas. I think the green people might have been um, uh, pharmacy students from university in Nairobi and I think the orange ones were graphic design students from a university or an art school in Nairobi. And then the, the other people were teachers. So once we have our base, we can then expand it worldwide. And now we need all the people that are going to come in and help. So first of all, we had the people in New Zealand and Australia, who was us and me and my team, and then the people from the University of Auckland. And then we put together a whole load of students from around the world, and this is where they actually came from. And then we put together a whole load of teachers who wanted to help, and that's where they came from. And then we put together a whole load of um, special guests, invited luminaries from around the world, and that's where they came from. So you can see when you put them all together, you've got quite a, a global kind of feel. So then what you then do is you take the physicality of location away and you group people together. And this was the pharmacy side of the project that worked for the first two months. And what we did was we split them up into two groups working on, there were six, six health issues. And into those six areas from the University of Auckland came six of their um, senior staff who were specialists in those areas. Again, if these students are trying to find out information about malaria, they've got to be talking to someone who's an expert in malaria, who are, who are basically building a, a profile or doing all the research about this project. So what is HIV AIDS in that area? How, how bad is it? And we'd put people together in online discussion forums and we'd, we'd give people live chat areas where everybody could, or for example, we'd every now and again put a really sort of what we call a VIP in it, who was, this was the volunteer of the year of, winner for Africa or something like that. And he came online and answered questions about how do you help people. So you could put him online live and people can ask him questions or her, depending on who it might be. And then they can submit their work as they're doing it into galleries where other people can see it and download it and view it and give feedback on it, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Now after two months, the pharmacists had done their bit and what they did was they ended up with written reports about all these illnesses or these health issues, let's say. And the graphic designers came in and took over from them. So they became almost like the client and they exchanged the brief. So then the graphic designers went away for another two months and in groups themselves um, started to work on the project. There was going to be three projects that we were going to make. We were actually looking for real outcomes and we were going to make three projects. So we formed three groups of all these people to work on those specific things. And what we did was we had what I, I called a world storming event, which was, it was getting a bit slow. People were saying, oh, let's do this, let's do this. And I said, right, you've all got, you know, 12 hours to come up with 10 ideas. And there was 200 people there. And we just quickly had, instead of brainstorming, we had world storming. So everybody around the world chucked in loads of ideas. And we sifted them down into a, a sort of 50 different ideas. And we sent them over to Kenya, or to the health workers and the people who lived there, and said, if we were to do these, which of these would be really good? And they came back with three. They said, if you could design a children's game, would be one, that'd be nice. If you could design some soccer outfits, that'd be nice, that'd be another one. And if you could design just some series of stickers that we can put everywhere, like a viral kind of campaign, that would be good as well. Okay, so that's what we were going to do. George Onyango, who I'm going to introduce you to in a minute, um, was, when I showed you that map, and there was two health workers in Kenya, George Onyango was one of them. So I set up a thing to say, George, would you mind coming in and sort of, you know, talking to um, these people as they ask questions? And he said, yes, I'll try and make it to the internet cafe whenever I can. And he's quoting their questions and answering them. And there he is, and there he is, and there he is. And then he'll disappear for a while. And then so more questions came in. And then there was loads of resources and loads of lectures. And then we were able to put up galleries of works in progress. And as the project went through, you can see here that there's the six reports written by the pharmacists, detailed reports. And then the graphic designers come in, and then therefore we came to produce a set of football shirts. 
and a set of stickers and a children's game, which is what they asked for in the end. Um, and these were some of the sort of process works of the children's game. So again, like me working in the film industry, not everyone's good at the same thing. So you look for strengths and weaknesses in people and try and put teams together of people who are a good graphic designer with a good writer, with a good illustrator, with a good person who just gets stuff done and manages a team and, and any team dynamics. So again, we came up with this idea for a series of cards which were it's kind of waterproof cards about this big that children in a playground could read and how do you get malaria? A from a mosquito, B from a friend, C from a spider, D from eating meat. And you know, just young children could play this game and sort of understand a little bit more about it. And you might ask, well that's in English. Yeah, it is in English. But we also made them in their dialect as well. Trouble is, there's so many dialects, so which one do you choose? And it was decided by the people in Kenya that English would be the best language to use. And this thing here was a design for the game board. And they, w they play out in the, in, the, in the grass of their sort of playground, and it's all very dusty and sandy, and, and it's not level, they've got tables and level stuff like that. So we designed these to be the ladies' headdresses that they would wear these as beautiful headdresses and you might go, oh, is that culturally sensitive? Yes, it was. We asked a series of women teachers over there, would you wear this? They said, yeah, I'd love to. It was really nice. It was the right colours. It was the right patterns. That they could then take this off and put it down on the floor and then kids could just throw a rock on it and whatever number it land on, they'd read that card out and between them they'd learn. So it'd be just like a little, little interactive game. But here they are using the card games. Um, the one that I most liked was this one, which was the football kit idea. We said, a lot of the students said to the people in, in Kenya, what do the young people wear? They say they wear the same as anyone else in the world wears, which is North American basketball tops. Although more recently, what with the introduction of a lot of African players into um, the, certainly the English Premier League and the Bundesliga and the, and the Spanish foot soccer league, uh, the Africans have become really, really prominent in these leagues. So they're there they're these kind of mentor, they're the sort of idols of, of the younger generation. So it's moving away from basketball kits to soccer kits now. So wouldn't it be good if we could do something with soccer kits that not only could they wear them to play soccer, but also hang around in the streets with them as well. So that was a good, we were looking for vehicles to get our message across. Here we go, some early ideas for some sort of soccer kits. Um, Chung, by the way, means get rid of, I think. So we kind of sort of started to go down this road and then introduced the colours, the, you know, the Kenyan colours and the colours of the landscape. And so there's a two-year process in start to finish. And last year we sent them off to Africa in these two boxes. And then we got a phone call from African um, immigration saying that um, we had to pay to have them clear through immigration. And I said, no, 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 they're, they're a gift to your country. They're of no commercial value. Um, what are they? The soccer kits and this and children's games. No, you owe us $1,000 to get them through customs. And then you think, well, hang on, if I give them 1,000, they know I've got $1,000, and then they're going to come back and say, now you owe us another 1,000. And that's how it works. That in, in many of these countries, and I know this absolutely firsthand, that once you show a bit of weakness, they go, oh, I got you now, and I'll ask for more, and I'll ask for more. So when I said, no, we're not going to pay it, they said, fine, we'll burn them. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, no, two years' work, and it's going to get burnt, and there's people just 100 miles. We've got it all the way to Kenya, and now we've got 100k to go to this little village, and they're going to get burnt, which they would have done. So I weakened, and I said, okay, here's your $1,000, and luckily they released them, and they went off to the, um, to the community and were picked up by our friend George and the, teacher, the headmaster from the school, and here they are saying, look, we've got our package. And, um, and the colour's not brilliant on here, but this is how they usually play. 90% um, of them haven't got any shoes on, so they're not wearing soccer boots and things, which is, oh, they haven't got shoes. But then here they are in their soccer kits, proud as anything, and that's the thing. They were so proud to wear these things and so, um, you know, honoured, and it really made them a team. And we asked them about the message and what was the message, and people were asking them about what, what does that, you know, why have you got HIV? Or is it? And they were, the question was being raised, so the awareness was being raised about it. This is George Onyango. Now, we've known this guy for... Um, we'd known this guy for 10 months or a year at least working on this project and uh, all the community had known him very, very well and they loved him to death and just when the project finished there was an election in Kenya or in this area and he went missing for two months assumed dead because the elections were incredibly violent and um, he, didn't, he didn't get killed but he lay low for a couple of months um, many people he knew got killed and it was this reality of wow, this is not our world you know, there's an election and so he vanishes for two months. Anyway, so he sent us over a video. We asked him, could you tell us what you thought of the project afterwards? And this was his reply. My name is Jojo Nyango. I'm the team leader of Help Heal. 
I was involved in the VIP 2007. The designs that followed were well received by the community and they are very happy to have been part of this noble idea. The soccer skates are being used for health education and the youth that are using these soccer skates, we have seen transformation in their lives. The stickers that are on public transport vehicles have elicited a lot of debate on health issues. And it is very evident that there's a lot of change of attitude towards certain ways how health was managed at the household level. The malaria card game in school has also increased knowledge of malaria among the parents and among the, the, the students and teachers. The teachers are well receptive of this and we hope that, that the collaborators in this project will continue to help winner. We are very happy and we are thankful for Rick and Natalie for having identified WINA for the purposes of VIP 2007. Thank, thank you. So projects like that sprung us into doing more projects like that. Not all of them with online communities, but all of them working with other creative, you know, other creative people, whether it was physically or some groups here and some groups there, and we link a bit by internet and a big bit by going and meeting them or bringing them here. More recently, I've, I've done two or three projects, and I'm just about to start another one, but I've done some projects in the Philippines, which again is, is another you know, interesting area of mine, um, very interesting people, culturally very different to me and, and probably you guys as well, unless you're from the Philippines. Not a million miles from here, it's a, quite a neighbour of ours, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, so it's not, it doesn't take a lot getting to. Um, and I did a project with a group of um, um, Filipino embroidery women of all ages. And I wanted to just take you through that as a totally different project to the African one. Um, again, you need partners. In any project you do like this, you need a partner. You need an intermediary you can trust. And in this case, I used a university. We're a big university. Um, these guys here were a big university, De La Salle University in Manila. And I went to them and said, look, I'm looking for a project to work on. Um, you know, pro bono, I'm not asking for, you know, we'll fund it all and everything like that. Anyway, so the university took me up into a region about four hours from Manila and just took me around the area. Again, to us, this looks like very sort of dilapidated and poor run-down area. Um, not at all. People are totally happy. This is their lifestyle. This is where they've lived all their lives, where they've grown up. However, these people need help. The river is a bit like the Kenyan one. The river is totally polluted, so therefore the men who, most of the men in the community who um, would work in their fisheries have now got no jobs and therefore their, their women are... are, are it's up to them to look after the families and, and, and sort of earn the income because there is physically no income for the men. Um, and so what I did was when I first went up there, I looked around, it was a beautiful sunny day and I took lots of pictures. And this is how I immersed myself in a project, try and get used to it. And this one in particular, which come back later on in the project, was their local chapel. Of course, the Filipinos are devout Catholics and the, the women who I'd work with would go to this chapel every day and, and start the day with prayers and stuff. Lovely little chapel as well, just from an architectural point of view. Um, and I'd go along with them, and not for the Christianity sort of thing, but just for the communal kind of thing, and to sort of show a bit of respect and support. And these were the women who started off with, eight of them, you know, various ages, um, various generations, and they took me around to their houses, and they showed me how they make the work that they do. And they make traditional Filipino clothes, which are incredibly skillful, uh, incredibly beautiful technique. Um, as clothes, you know, would I buy one? No, nah, horrible, not my thing. Um, and I, and I, I was quite open with them. I said, look, that's great for you guys, but it's such a Filipino thing. And it's only certain Filipino. It's a, it's a ceremonial dress that they wear. So you'll get MPs wearing it, and, and at weddings people wear them. But it's not casual wear, and so therefore the market's particularly select and specific. Um, and the, and the, the, the labour involved is particularly intense, and I'll show you, you know, you can see here, you know, incredibly all freehand, no patterns, just done freehand, completely freehand, incredibly fast as well. You can't see the hands move, they rattle through that. But I did look at it, and this was the first house I went to, and I said, geez, if you put that on a white, you know, cotton shirt, I'd buy that, that's quite nice. Um, I'm thinking that if you could move what they do into a different context, 
then maybe we could help them with their... Not, not again, a bit like technology and face-to-face. -face. It's like, don't replace it, just add to it. So it's a beautiful tradition handed down. And you can see here that the patterns change. And this is the young, the young people um, who are bringing in new patterns to what they do. And here's the young girls sitting outside watching their older sisters and their mums working on this. Um, and particularly relevant as well, because these are rural communities. And sadly to say that if they don't do this, their alternative is to move to the city, which again breaks up the family, which the family is a massively strong thing in, in these areas of the Philippines. And secondly, the other worst thing is that if they're not doing this, where are these young girls going to go in Manila? They're going to end up in clubs and bars and things like that. So to really keep the, um, you know, keep the families together and keep the work together it was an important driving force in trying to work something out. So anyway, we came up with a project which we called Reframe, which would focus on the detail of intricate, the intricacy of Filipino embroidery by framing it off and placing it in new contexts. So we just started to do this. What about if we made little squares of embroidery? And what about if we made them for hotels and, and interior designs? Or what about if we made jewellery out of them? And we came up with loads and loads of ideas. And eventually, um, I went back to the School of Design and Art as part of De La Salle University. This is their new absolutely brand new building. It was not even one year old when I started this project. So this is the foyer. And I said to them, for your first birthday, for the building's first birthday, I'd like to sort of do, a, do an art installation um, made out of embroidery. And they said, oh, that's really fascinating, yeah. Um, and I said, then you're going to pay for it. So, um, which they did in the end. So I went back to my references and I thought I really got stuck on this church. I thought it was really, really important to, sort of get to, to bring this church in. So this was... Now you can see down the bottom, I don't know if you can see the seats, this is a sort of Photoshop mock-up of the, the interior, and it's about six stories high opposite the, the lifts, and it's a massive great white wall with nothing on it, and I kind of thought, that, you know, this needs something on it, and I started to design with one of my staff in, in here in the Omnium office, the two of us started to design, you know, what we could do with this, um, this sort of piece of work. From their point of view, they were just producing embroidery pieces, but from our point of view, we were trying to produce, almost like produce a sculptural piece. Again, you know, I was bringing the influence of pixels and our world of digital technology and stuff. Um, but there was many, many meanings to the patterns that we made, which related to um, the area where they came from, the colours of the Filipino flag. The, the, there's, a, there's a whole load of hidden meanings in there, but at the end of the day, it's a sort of mosaic picture of a church with some colours on it. And so therefore we had to then um, go and produce this thing. So back I went now with the job in hand to these ladies, the ten ladies, and we started to work on these things, like I would with a group here. Um, and were they up for change? Hell yes, they were up for change. They really embraced this, but they were so scared of what to do that they were going to let someone down. But that we, we took a period of six months to go through it with them. And we were now funding them to work on this. So I ran workshops with them, the head of School of Design, Liz Williamson, she came with me on one trip and we, we introduced each other and worked together and gave lectures. And here they were, just the same as students would hear, presenting their work, presenting their ideas, and learning how to do a process, and most importantly, learning how to run a business, which is where they were sort of losing money all over the place. So they started coming up with designs for um, the interiors of each, because every single one of these frames would be different. And in the end, there was two and a half thousand of them. But we, not only did we have to make the, the textiles, but we also had to frame them. And this was a real success from my point of view because someone suddenly said, hey, there's a guy down in the next village who, and don't forget all the men are out of work because there's no fish in the river, um, there's a guy down in the next village who, who is a whittler. Now, a whittler is someone who just gets bits of old driftwood and just whittles it away and makes it into new things. So he, uh, here he is, he's whitt whittling. It's actually a word. And so I went and talked to him and some of his staff and went round their workshops, which is probably the only workshop within hundreds of miles. And... Um, if you, anyone remember, old enough to remember the old days of what workshops used to look like before occupational health and safety came in, um, that's a good workshop. And where the wood came from, what I thought was brilliant, and I asked him, I said, where did you get this wood from? Because it's beautiful. And he said, from these, they're from Toyota. And so what happens is, Toyota come and pack all these things into the country and throw the wood out, and he goes around and gets them all, pulls all the nails out, cuts them up into pieces, and they all sand them down, and that's what every single one of our frames was made out of, these. So they were originally a packing case. And then we started to frame off all these in massively intricate pieces of embroidery, stunning embroidery we'd done into colours. And then they came up with a way of framing these things that was exactly similar to the way that they make embroidery, which is in a, instead of a square, in a hoop. And I, I, this was great at this point, because I was thinking, 
do you know what, I, I don't know how to do this. And in the end, you can just say to them, look, you just go and work it out. And they come back next time, they have this wonderful solution. It's like, that's exactly what we want. And when you've got two and a half thousand of them to do, it's got to be cheap. So then we had the installation problem. And um, I went over with some of my office, and um, we got there, and there was the um, scaffolding. Again, health and safety, if you just touch that, it's wobbling all over the shop. There's no tie-offs on it at all. So incredibly organized, they said it would be there, and there it was. And then we brought all the boxes down. Every single box had a, a whole load of specifically numbered um, pieces in and different colors. There was 27 different colors. So it's very simply, we just laid it out on the floor with numbers. Here's some helpers from the school. Here's me sort of packing them into boxes ready to go up. And they, we just did, there's one row, there's two rows, there's three rows, there's four rows. Handed over to the uh, installers who were an art... This guy here, Johnny Soriano, his name was. He was an art installer. Now, in his case, p people have written books about him. Not about the work he's installed, but about him and how he installs work. He's, he's a real celebrity, lovely guy. And he said to me, um, no, my boys will get it ready by tomorrow, uh, which I doubted. Um, but they did, and it went all the way through the night, and then they started to take this scaffolding down and down and down, and in the end there was a six-storey high mosaic made out of 2,566 squares, all made by these women in this village and the men who had made the frames and kept them employed. And when it started off with 10 women, it's now up to 56 women in that collective who they've grown, so they're starting to support each other. And of course, in true style, they made a real song and dance of it and had a great big opening night, including lighting show and, um, <laughs> you know, and specifically written hymn for it, uh, which I thought was quite nice. Uh, and it was stunning. Not, you know, what they'd done was brilliant. And the students had designed the lighting show from the art school. And it wasn't just sort of put some lights on. It was a whole half-hour extravaganza where they designed this lighting show and the music and everything. And it's become quite well known in terms of interior design. And this was the ladies who made it in their posh frocks and down to the city for, for the night, who'd never been out of their town, certainly never dr dressed up in this kind of outfit. And when they, we had there was a hotel for them, they actually wanted to, they didn't want to stay in the hotel, they wanted to stay underneath it for the night. Because it was their work, you know, this is what they were so proud of it. And it wasn't to do with money, although that obviously helped, it wasn't to do, I mean, it was very much about supporting their families, but what it was most about for them, on feedback from them, was the respect that other people were seeing what they did, that they were respecting what they did, and that they realized that it wasn't just, they weren't just faceless people who produced beautiful work, sold it to someone for a dollar, which got sold for a hundred dollars, and nobody ever knew who they were or who made these barongs, outfits that they made. Here they were getting recognized for their work.